Software and Security Engineering, Lecture 4 continued. The um, design of the CAP calculator used by UK clearing banks brings in a new failure mode which is actually outside the realm of crypto protocols so you might not have spotted it. The problem is this, that the banks have now put into the hands of the population millions of devices that can be used to check um, a PIN on a bank card. And so the failure mode is that if you're held up for your bank card by a mugger, you know, waving a knife at you in some dodgy street in the east end of London, um, then he can ask you what your PIN is and he can check the answer that you give him with the help of a cap calculator and threaten to do some surgery on you if it's wrong. Previously, this wasn't an issue because the bad guy would have had to drag you to an ATM and force you to do a transaction there, and he'd be worried about being caught on the CCTV. So this actually has uh, led to some muggings and unfortunately to a couple of fatalities. So that's in passing a point on usability design, and um, it's safety rather than security, but nonetheless it's part of the same metrics. Now let's move on to the next topic, which is key management protocols. And this is a problem that came up in the 1970s once people invented local area networks um, and started getting uh, machines to communicate with each other and to share resources such as file servers and printers. And let's look at this in more abstract cryptographic terms to begin with. Suppose Alice and Bob each share a key with Sam and want to communicate. We can imagine that um, Alice and Bob are machines, or Alice is a user on a machine and Bob is a resource on another machine, such as a file server or a printer, and Sam is an authentication server um, who um, knows the secrets to bind the whole thing together. So how might it work? Well, the obvious way to do it is that Alice calls Sam and asks for a key for Bob, and um, Sam then sends Alice a key encrypted in a blob that only she can read, and sends the same key also encrypted in another blob that only Bob can read. And Alice then calls Bob and sends in the second blob. And one of the questions that you might ask, having seen man in the middle attacks and uh, the like, is how can they check that the protocol's fresh? How can they check that it isn't a replay that's being replayed by Charlie, who um, spoke to one or other of them earlier? Well, um, the system that is widely used was developed in the late 70s, early 80s to authenticate um, uh, Unix machines on a LAN and is now used in Windows um, and, and other systems. It's called Kerberos. Um, Kerberos was the three-headed uh, dog who was the guardian of the underground. And it works more or less as we saw on the previous page, uh, but with the addition of timestamps. So Alice sends to Sam, I'm Alice and I'd like to speak to Bob. And Sam then sends to Alice a, a timestamp, TS, produced by Sam, uh, a, a, a length of time, L, for which the um, key is going to be valid, a key, KAB, for a communication between Alice and Bob, Bob's name, B, and then a blob um, containing information encrypted with the key, KBS, which is the key that um, Bob shares with Sam, and this contains similar information in the timestamp, um, the validity period, the key KAB, and Alice's name A, and this whole thing is encrypted with the key KAS um, that um, Alice shares with Sam. So Alice can decrypt that, and she can pull out the blob, the um, <coughs> encrypted um, uh, message for Bob, and she sends that to Bob um, along with a challenge. And how this works in Kerberos is that she sends her name Alice followed by a timestamp encrypted by KAB and Bob then certifies that he is um, present and correct by incrementing the uh, timestamp by one so he has to decrypt the packet first see what the timestamp is add one encrypt it again using the key KAB uh, and sends that back to Alice and in a simple system S is a ticket granting server giving access to a resource B in a more complicated system, you can have a hierarchy of servers. You can have an authentication server to which Alice logs on and a ticket-granting server which knows about Bob, and you add extra protocol messages to add indirection in between and to take trust from where it exists uh, to where it's needed. And this is the basic mechanism that is used to scale authentication um, in, in local networks of Windows and Linux machines. 
Next example of a, a protocol um, is EMV, the European MasterCard Visa um, protocol for doing payments um, with chip and PIN cards. This is what you use um, in one variant or another when you take your chip and PIN card to buy a sandwich at the cafeteria, when you use it to get uh, money out of a cash machine um, in, in the high street. So the customer goes to the merchant, which might be a merchant terminal or might be an ATM, and um, he produces a signed string of data, which is um, basically the customer's credentials, the customer's primary account number, plus card data such as the expiry date and one or two other bits and pieces. And this is all signed uh, by the bank which issued the card. Now, the merchant um, knows how to identify bank signatures, so the merchant can um, validate this. And the merchant then sends to the customer a card um, a random challenge N, a date, an amount, and the personal account, the personal information number that was entered into the terminal if a PIN was in fact used. Um, if it was a transaction that didn't use a PIN, such as a, a tap and pay transaction or a chip and signature transaction, then there isn't a PIN. The customer card then sends to the merchant um, the relevant data encrypted under a key which is shared between the customer card and the card issuing bank. So that's the random challenge that the uh, merchant sent to the card, the date, the amount, and some transaction data. And the transaction data has got some parameters, for example, whether a PIN was used or not, and um, uh, the um, output of any fraud engine on the card, and so on and so forth. Now, the merchant can't do anything with this um, encrypted data because it's encrypted under a key shared between the um, customer card and the bank, and the merchant isn't privy to that. So all the merchant can do is to bundle up um, this ciphertext um, with um, its own transaction data, which is its own view of the transaction, and encrypts this um, with a key that it shares with the bank, or with its bank, if it's a different bank, and, it, and for simplicity we'll ignore the interbank step. And the bank um, then sends to the merchant um, a message which is relayed to the card, which says, OK. Um, encrypted um, with the uh, key shared between the card and the bank. So this is a slightly different protocol uh, from the uh, Kerberos protocol. It's got transaction data in it rather than just keys and timestamps. So what you might do now is sit down and think for a couple of minutes how you might go about attacking this protocol.